Check out FlipSideGaming.com for all your gaming needs. Use the promo code HEROES for 10% off any purchase over $10. If you use that promo code between now and January 28th, you will automatically be entered in a drawing to win a Ravnica Allegiance Booster Box. Check out the description below for details. Hey there, this is John from Heroes and the Legends, and welcome to part four of our five-part Ravnica Allegiance full set review. Today we're looking at Rakdos. We're going to look at each Rakdos card that has a watermark, as well as all of the red cards that do not have watermarks today. If you've been watching this series, you know what to expect here. This is a limited set review. We're going to look at each card individually and discuss how they work best in the limited formats, draft and sealed. Quickly before we get started, though, just a fast reminder, if you check out the description below, you'll find a few ways to support the channel one of which is our Patreon page. You're also going to find links to products on Amazon down below. If you make any purchases on Amazon once you go through one of those links, no matter what it is, we'll get a small percentage for the channel. Finally, Flipside Gaming, still offering a promo code for our viewers. Hopefully you can save a little cash while you support us. But as always, thank you not only to the folks that use those links, but to each and every one of you. You all make the channel the success that it has been. So thank you, and let's get into it. We'll begin by looking at the red cards that do not have watermarks first. Active Treason. Okay, this is a familiar card. It's a reprint. Not a ton of reprints in this set. In fact, in today's video, there's this one and two cards at the end. Everything else is new. But let's talk about Active Treason. Generally, threatened effects are kind of hit or miss for me in Limited. Sometimes I'll play them, sometimes I won't. Just depends on my deck build. They're not great when you're behind, unfortunately. If you're getting beat down, stealing a creature for a turn and attacking in may not be where you need to be. You need something more defensive or something to stabilize you. But if you're in a board stall or you're trying to close out a game, this is a lot better. And I do think Rakdos will appreciate this, especially in this environment. And here's why. First off, Rakdos is all about getting damage across any way they can. As the game goes on, they may have trouble continually getting damage across with small creatures. So taking an opponent's evasive creature at some point and doing a little more damage is not a bad thing. Secondly, in this set, black has a lot of sacrifice abilities, so it is entirely possible that you might be able to steal an opponent's creature, attack with it, and then sacrifice it for benefit. And that's actually kind of awesome, right? So there is a light aristocrats theme in Rakdos, as well as the fact that it's a very aggressive color pairing. And I mentioned this in yesterday's video, but also think about Mardu as a color combination sometimes because the Orzhov mechanics do interact very well with the Rakdos mechanics in some cases. They both do have a light aristocrats theme at the very least, so just keep that in mind. Amplifier. Okay, this one's weird. It's a rare, and it doesn't feel like a huge bomb rare to me. I'm not going to say it's not playable under certain circumstances, though, but here's my issue with it. It costs four. It's a 1-1 one, one until it gets back around to your turn again. So it's really fragile, it's just hanging out there for a while as a 1-1. One, one. That's not going to feel good. Now, if it can survive, then when you get back to your upkeep, you look at the cards at the top of your deck until you find a creature. This will get double the power and toughness of whatever that creature is. Then the cards you reveal go back to the bottom of your deck in a random order, so you don't lose them. And this doesn't have Trample. It doesn't have Menace. It doesn't have any kind of evasion. So you get a big, dumb creature, basically. Now, it could be a really big, dumb creature some of the time, but it's high variance. This might be best in Gruul, where you have a better chance of hitting large things. If I hit a 5-5 five, five, or 6-6, six, six, now this is a 10-10 or 12-12, until I get back around to my upkeep again, and I have to do it again. Now, the problem is, in Limited especially, you're going to have a nice curve, a lot of 2-drops, a lot of 3-drops. That means you might have a lot of 2-2, two, 3-3 two, three, three creatures. Now, if you hit a 2-2, two, two, this is still a 4-4. Four, four. It's not the worst thing in the world. But again, without any kind of trample or something like that, I don't really know what this card's always going to do for you. Is it horrible? Is it unplayable? No. Especially in Gruul, I would probably just run it anyway, because a big, dumb creature sometimes will be good enough and limited. But it's not an amazing rare compared to some of the others you might be opening. So just keep that in mind, especially in a Rakdos build where your things might tend to be smaller. I don't know if this is always going to be worth your time. Burn Bright. This is kind of a retake on Trumpet Blast, but it does fix the issue that new players sometimes will get confused by that card. They want to read it closely, and then if an opponent was attacking, they try to use it defensively. Turns out it just pumps the attacking creatures. They would take more damage. Probably doesn't feel real good. I like this because you can use it defensively, so it's actually a more powerful card. And whether I'm using it defensively or offensively, I'll be happy to have it. Now, I want to use this offensively. Whether I'm in Rakdos or Gruul, it's going to be a fine card, and I'd be happy to run one of these. 
Rakdos will really appreciate it because you might be going a little wider there compared to Gruul, and you need to push across damage any opportunity you get. The second you stop damaging your opponent with Rakdos, you're in trouble. When that deck runs out of gas, it's a bad thing. This keeps you attacking into deeper turns, and I like that a lot. Now in Gruul, you could have some big trample creatures, and even though you might not be as wide, you could still be putting across a lot of damage with something like this, and it could close out a game there too. And that's ultimately what you hope this card will do for you. Cavalcade of Calamity. All right, now this isn't all that good unless you have a number of creatures that are power one or less. Without those creatures, this isn't doing anything. So that's really awkward. At least it's cheap. I'll give it that. It only costs two. Now in an aggressive build, if you happen to have these small creatures, well, wonderful. It actually could be good, but I don't see a deck really performing very well with a lot of small creatures trying to rely on this as a crotch. Just doesn't seem to make sense. Maybe you could draft around this a little bit. In a seal pool, I just don't really see it coming together at all. And ultimately, if you did get it together, well, okay, it does what Rakdos might want to do. It could push across damage, accelerate damage. It could also turn on Spectacle for free, basically, just based off the attack. That's decent. But again, the setup here just doesn't feel realistic to me. Maybe, just maybe, I could see this in a Mardu build with a lot of afterlife because with the tokens in the air, now they could attack and they will typically be 1-1s. They're going to attack in and get this bonus. That at least is a possibility where I could see myself maybe playing this card. I think most of the time though you skip it. Dagger Caster. This is a good card. It's a little weird though. It costs 4, it's a 2-3, so that's not great economy, but it has a nice ability. When it enters the battlefield, it's going to ping an opponent and then every creature they control. So if they have a lot of low toughness creatures, maybe a lot of afterlife flyers or something like that, then this is going to be devastating. So if you're not main decking it, definitely bring it in against Orzhov. Now, the other plus side to this is it can turn on Spectacle. The only thing that's weird about that, though, is it costs four. So how much mana will you have left over to play your Spectacle spell, right? Later in the game, you will have mana left over, I'm sure. Early in the game, you might not. So this might not always be a turn four play for you. You might want to think of this as a later play. And if you don't have a lot of good spectacle in your deck, maybe you just skip this generally, right? And just bring it in out of the sideboard if you need it. But if you have a lot of spectacle, especially cheaper spectacle spells, and we'll see some as we go through the video today, then maybe this is worth running in the main. Remember too, there's a flicker spell in white at common, Justice Here's Portal. And if you had that in a Mardu build with this, you might find a little bit of value. Deface. It's a sideboard card. Not a lot to say about this one. You come across a problematic defender or a problematic artifact. You're going to side it in. I wouldn't start off with this in my deck, though. Electro Dominance. Okay, this thing is awesome. Now, let's not even talk about the whole free spell thing first. Let's just talk about that first part of the card. This will deal X damage to any target. Two red and X. Yeah, this is a no-brainer. If you're playing red, throw this in your deck because it's amazing. In a board style, long game, you can just burn out your opponent at some point. That's great. This will be awesome, especially for Rakdos, because like I mentioned, they could be running out of gas. You might have got a lot of early damage in, but you need to get like maybe six, seven, eight more points of damage and you're stuck. Well, this gets you past that, definitely. Also, early in the game, it can even things out by taking out a creature if you're falling behind, or even a planeswalker if that's applicable, right? This could also turn on spectacle in a pinch, although the second part of the spell might make that unnecessary at times. So the versatility is awesome. Now let's talk about this free spell you get. You may cast a card with converted mana cost X or less from your hand without paying the mana cost. So this is an instant that basically turns almost any card into an instant. So you could use this as a combat trick to drop a creature on the fly. You could use this to play sorcery on your opponent's turn. This is really, really sweet. The only drawback I can think to this card is it's double red, so maybe it's not easily splashed into some decks, but who cares? This thing is awesome. If I'm playing red and I'm going to play this card, it is amazing. It's a rare. It's not going to show up all that much. But when it does, you're going to be real happy. Feral Maka. Okay, this is a 2-2 two -two for 2. Sign me up. I'll play it all day long. I prefer 2-2s two for 2 with abilities. I mean, we've kind of gotten spoiled in recent years with that. But you don't always see that with red. And I'm okay with this. This is an awesome curve filler. I won't bore you with all the details of why that's important. Again, we talked about that a lot in the last few videos, but bottom line is you need two drops. So here you go. Here's a two drop for your curve. 
Flames of the Raised Boar. Okay, this is a little expensive, but it does do four damage to target creature and opponent controls. So that's pretty good. And you're going to use this probably more often than not, unless you happen to have better removal spells that are cheaper, and you might some of the time. But it's an instant. It's going to deal with a pretty sizable creature. You're going to be relatively happy with it. Now, here's where it gets interesting. If you have a large creature, it also deals two damage to each other creature that player controls. So as long as you have something that's power four or greater. Now, obviously, this gets a little better probably in Gruul because you'll have a better chance of having that large creature on the battlefield. Rakdos might have less of a chance of that happening. But like I said, if Rakdos needs a removal spell, I don't think they care that much. Now, if you do have large creatures, this is a great card to deal with certain strategies. Again, maybe the Rakdos strategy, which could go a little smaller when it comes to toughness the afterlife strategy with the 1-1 one -one creatures in the air. This is another way to hose those type of things too. So if you're not main decking this for some reason, maybe you just feel like you have better removal spells, bring it in against certain matchups for sure. Gates of Blaze. Okay, in some of the other videos, we talked about the gate drafting strategy and how sometimes you're in a situation where you can't seem to get into a guild and you end up going four or five colors, you get a lot of gates. This is one of those cards that will reward you for that. Now, it deals X damage to each creature, so that does include your own creatures. Keep that in mind. But if you can go a little larger generally and you have a lot of gates, then this is something that you might want to run. But it is a very niche card. You're not going to use this all the time. Now, if I have a few gates, I might consider it, especially if I'm going a little larger anyway. Maybe I'm in Gruel Colors, and I think I don't have all that many small creatures that could get hit by this. Maybe I have like three gates in my deck, and I'm assuming at some point I might be able to do this for two later in the game. Okay, maybe it's runnable, but not for all builds, definitely. I would consider siding it in, though, again, against some of these smaller builds, Rakdos or Orzov, Mardu generally, I guess. If your opponent's on that plan, then maybe, who knows, I might even side some gates in to play this to use it as a defense mechanism against their strategy. So think about those things when you're sideboarding. There's some creative options, definitely, that you'll have in this set. Goblin Gathering. Okay, you need stuff to sacrifice if you're in Rakdos colors, basically. Like I said earlier, Black's got a lot of good sacrifice abilities. This is something that's going to give you things to sacrifice. That alone might make it playable. The downside is, the first time you play this, if you don't have any copies of it in your graveyard, two one ones for three isn't great economy. So if I don't really need the sacrifice fodder, I'll probably skip this, unless I happen to get a lot of these, which might be more applicable in draft than sealed. Because as you go forward, if you do really want to go wide and push, maybe you have something like Burn Bright in your deck then the economy gets better and better with more of these that you play. So if you have one in your graveyard, now I'm getting three one ones for three, that's a lot better. Two in my graveyard, four one ones for three, that's excellent. So these will get better in multiples, definitely. Another card that could fit into that more Orzhov light Mardu strategy too sometimes. Immolation Shaman. This is another really solid rare. Great for Rakdos, but even if I'm in Gruul, I would consider this one. Because it's a 2-2-1-3. Two, two, it's not a 2-2-for-2. Two, two two. You know, I love those. But a 2 casting cost 1-3 with these abilities will be just fine. Whenever an opponent activates an ability of an artifact, creature, or land that isn't a mana ability, this will deal 1 damage to that player. So that is potentially a way sometimes to turn on Spectacle. That's interesting. But also, it's more pressure. Your opponent is still making the decision whether they're going to do that. But the extra damage they may have to take occasionally is going to go into that Rakdos formula of slowly, eventually getting them down to zero, right? Also beyond that, if you're in a board stall and things are slowing down, your Rakdos creatures just aren't cutting it anymore. This can be pumped up and given Menace, so that's kind of nice. Plus three, plus three in Menace for the two red and three. Later in the game in a board stall, you might be able to activate that twice in one turn even, and now it's plus six, plus six in Menace. That's actually pretty awesome, so... Yeah, this is a good card early. It's a good card late, especially for Rakdos. Mirror March. Oh, wow. Okay. I have a love-hate relationship with this card. Logically, I feel like I shouldn't play it, right? But I'm totally going to play this card, and it's probably not going to work out great for me, but I'm totally going to do it. Here's the thing. It's a super high variance card. It costs six. Cost six does nothing on its own. That's usually a big red flag right there, right? But whenever a non-token creature enters the battlefield under your control, flip a coin until you lose the flip. For each flip you win, you create a token that's a copy of that creature. They gain haste, and then you exile them at the beginning of the next end step. Kind of like a Splinter Twin sort of thing, but completely random, right? There are some synergies between this and some cards in white if you do time it right. Again, I'm thinking Justice Sears Portal here. There's also Lumbering Battlement, but that one is also a rare, so that will be pretty rare. 
And regardless, even with the synergies, you still have to be lucky. Magical Christmas lands. I play this amazing big trample creature, or I play something with an awesome enters the battlefield effect, and I just keep winning coin tosses, and I just win the game. That could happen. Or I could play this for six, get beat down for a turn, I'm down to like five life, get to my turn, play a creature that's a 2-2, two, two, and then it has a copy that has haste, and then I lose the next coin flip. Yeah. So I'm not a big fan of high variance cards. There's big risk and reward here. The reward could be really high, especially in a gruel deck. But I don't know. Is it worth the risk? I'm going to try it. You're going to try it too, aren't you? If we're lucky, it will be good. If we're not, it's going to be real bad. Rubble Reader. We're used to seeing these type of cards, the four mana, destroy target land, and then they do something else this time. It scries too, which is pretty good. Now, it's a little awkward maybe in the set because there's no non-basic lands that do anything other than fix mana. So there's not going to be some crazy non-basic that you need to be gunning for. But if my opponent is getting a little too greedy on colors, this could definitely put them back. And that's when I'm going to sideboard it in. So look at it this way. It can hit any land, not just non-basic. So that's actually kind of sweet. But I'm probably going to bring this in if my opponent is going deep into four or five colors. Maybe they're on the gate plan. I can take out a gate and that could be disruptive. Perhaps I saw a real fragile splash in game one, something like that. If I feel like I can do something to my opponent to throw them off their game and their curve, then I'll bring it in. Rubble Belt Recluse. Okay, it's one of these big dumb creatures that has to attack. Sometimes that is a drawback, of course, if you need it defensively. But this one only costs five and it's a six five. I don't think that's that bad for a common. If you need a five drop in your curve, this is not the worst thing, especially for Gruel. I mean, Gruul is going to have some big creatures. This kind of plays into that formula. There are some rewards for having big creatures too, so this is one that's reasonably costed for the most part. And Rakdos even might not hate this as a higher portion of their curve to just have a larger creature that's going to keep attacking too. Because in Rakdos, you basically want to keep attacking as much as you can anyway, right? So yeah, it's actually not a bad common. Rumbling Ruin. This one's interesting because it costs six. Now, if you just look at the stats, a 6-6 six, six for six doesn't look amazing. No trample or evasion or anything like that here. But the ability is interesting. It is reliant on board state, though. You have to have some plus one, plus one counters on your stuff for this to be really good. But if you do, this could be great and could even close out a game for you. So obviously, Red has Riot. That's part of the Gruel strategy. So this could be good in Gruel. But you might have enough cards even in Red, or maybe you're going Jun colors even and you have counters on some of your things in a more rakdos focused deck, then, yeah, it could be good there, too, because, again, having a turn where your stuff can't be blocked could be huge, right, and could be game-ending there. Remember, in Mardu, you do have access to Justice Here's Portal again, too. So this might not be for every deck, but if you feel confident that you're going to have a number of plus one, plus one counters and it's going to make a difference, it could definitely be playable even good sometimes. Just remember, though, when you're using the Riot creatures, you might want to slow down a little bit and put the counter on them more often than using haste if you think this could be a play that you need to win the game. Scorch Mark. Yeah, it's good. I don't have a lot to say about this one. Two casting cost instant, two damage to a creature. It exiles that creature if it were to die, so that's kind of nice. It turns off Afterlife, so that will be relevant at least some of the time. But even if I'm not playing against Afterlife, I mean, it's a real solid removal spell for two. Nice and cheap. It's going to deal with a lot of things, especially in the early portion of the game. Smelt Ward Ignis. This is actually pretty good. Again, if you have some of those sacrifice abilities in black, this will be great. Now, the drawback being when you use this thing, you do have to sacrifice it. And you can only take something smaller. It has to be creature of power three or less. So it's not anything this time around. But here's the upside. Remember earlier I mentioned sometimes threatened effects feel a little lackluster when you're behind. Well, if I'm behind, at least this is board presence. I don't have to necessarily use the effect at all if I just need a 2-1 creature or a blocker or something like that right away. So that's pretty good. You can only use this any time that you could cast a sorcery, so you can't use it like a combat trick or something like that. But be aware that when it's sitting on the battlefield, your opponent knows it's there, right? So they might not overcommit with their best thing. That's not necessarily horrible for you either, though, because at least it's slowing them down. Another card, too, that will make sense in the Orzhov base deck with a little red. Spear Spewer. Okay, this one is a great way to turn on Spectacle. It's real cheap, just costs one, it's a zero-two. Now, 
Granted, at first you feel like, well, that's not what I want to do in a Rakdos deck. I want to put the pressure on, but this deals one damage to each player every turn. That's going to keep the pressure on even through a board stall. And turning on Spectacle for free, basically, is going to be awesome. Stormstrike, real cheap combat trick here. You're going to be happy to have it. Target creature gets plus one, plus one, first strike, and you get to scry one. Rakdos will appreciate this because it allows them to keep attacking deeper into the game because you know you'll have this combat trick to hopefully protect a creature if you need to. And Grohl, this will be fine too because you'll have large creatures and giving a large creature a little bump and first strike sometimes will be very relevant. It does a lot for one mana. I'm happy to run a copy of this in my decks generally if I'm in red. Tin Street Dodger, great Rakdos aggro card right here. 1-1 one, one for 1 with haste so you can start attacking early. It turns on Spectacle. And when it can't get by, at least in most cases, you can use that red ability to force it by. Now, granted, if your opponent has a defender, it can be stopped, but that might not always happen. And you could get consistent damage across just for one mana. And it gets past board stalls. It turns on spectacle. Everything Rakdos wants to do. All right, let's move on to the red watermarked Rakdos cards. Light up the stage. All right. One of the things I said earlier, Rakdos, aggro decks generally. Sometimes they run out of gas. This is a way to prevent that, and it has a spectacle cost of just one red, which will be relevant many times. So especially with this spell, the spectacle cost will be nice in the middle portion of the game, because it will free up your mana to play some of these cards you exiled, so that's good. If you can pull it off, wonderful. Later in the game, though, even if I can't pull off the spectacle, three mana might not be backbreaking either. Basically... Rakdos, aggro, you want to see as many cards as possible so you don't run out of gas. You don't want to hit too many lands, for example. So this will hopefully help you get to more of your heat when you need to. Rick's Mighty Reveler. Okay, this one's another rare, and it's a good one. It's a 2-2 two, two for 2 with upside. You know how I feel already. So consider this, though. I play this on turn 2. I do have to rummage. It's not a May ability. I have to do it. I don't think it's a bad thing, though, for you most of the time, just because rummaging is a good effect. And again, remember, you don't want to get too land heavy when it comes to your Rakdos aggro build. So pitching a land isn't going to be the worst thing in the world to see another card. I think that's very good. Again, in Mardu, you could flicker this and do it again sometimes. There are also at least a few ways to interact with the graveyard. So maybe you can get the card back later if you need it. Also, if you don't have a card in your hand, you still get to draw, which is really sweet. And that goes for the second part of the ability, too. Now, later in the game, when a 2-2 two, two for 2 might not be good enough and a rummage might not even be good enough anymore, then you have the option of maybe paying a little more for the spectacle cost if you can do some damage. And if that's the case, you discard your hand, which hopefully is pretty much empty anyway at this point, and you draw three cards. Three cards is a lot of cards to see, especially in Rakdos colors. Maybe you find that last burn spell to close out the game, something like that could be really good. So, two drop that's good early, good late. Sign me up all day long, I'll play this card. It's a rare, you're not going to see it all the time, sadly, but it's very good. Skewer the Critic, speaking of very good. Three casting cost, spectacle cost of just one red, which is really cool. Three damage to any target. It's sorcery speed, so it's not quite like a lightning bolt if you spectacle, but close enough for Drafter Sealed. Awesome, awesome common here. If you can pick this up in a draft, maybe pick up a second copy if you're real lucky, awesome. You're not going to see these floating around the table, though, because it is splashable. You can put this in any deck. So it's really solid in limited games. If you're lucky in a sealed pool, you'll find one, maybe two of these. But I really love this for Rakdos, because, again, you have to push across that last damage sometimes. Later in the game, this can still do that. If I can't turn on Spectacle to play this for the Spectacle cost, I could still play it for three. I mean, it's still good in the limited environment at three, definitely. And it does turn on Spectacle at that point for another spell, maybe. So this is going to be. Fantastic. Spike Wheel Acrobats. This one is not thrilling to me. And you think to yourself, well, it's got a spectacle cost. How bad could it be? Well, it's not a great cost. A 5-2 for 3 is not horrible. But it's still going to trade down for 2 drops that are 2 power? Yikes. And I had to activate Spectacle to make that happen. If I don't activate Spectacle, it's a 5-2 for 4. Even worse. I'm not feeling this one. I mean, it's too fragile. It doesn't have trample or anything like that to push across damage. If you got better things, and a lot of the time you will, skip this one. Okay, let's move on to the black cards with the Rakdos watermark. Blade Juggler. Okay, everything I said about the last card, now I'm going to break my rule here. A 3-2 for 5 normally doesn't sound good, right? 3-2 for 3, even that normally doesn't sound great. I wouldn't play those cards if they were vanilla, but this is not vanilla. 
This does a point of damage to you when it enters the battlefield, but you draw a card. Okay, you know what? Drawing the card, especially in Rakdos colors, I'm on board. Board presence, seeing more of my cards, two of the most important aspects of an aggro deck, I'm going for it. So yes, even if I have to pay five for this, I feel like I'm still okay with it. Better if I can pay three, but I'm okay paying five. And I'm still going to play this. It does make sense in Rakdos. I might even play this in some other builds that are black. This has an Enters the Battlefield effect, so don't forget about Justice Here's Portal if you're playing Mardu. Dead Revel is actually one of the few ways to interact with the graveyard in this set. Return two target creature cards from your graveyard to your hand for four mana or spectacle of two. Again, this is heat. It's not card draw, but later in the game when your creatures have died, it does let you dip back in, get them back out for more board presence, and that could do two things for you. In a Rakdos deck, it keeps the pressure on, which is important. Or if I'm sacrificing a lot of stuff for benefit in that aristocrat strategy, this could bring stuff back so I can do it again. That's actually pretty cool too. So it might feel a little slow, but you're going to always find value here, especially if you play it for the spectacle cost. I can see this being good in both Rakdos and Orzhov or a Mardu build because, again, even the Orzhov colors do have that light aristocrat strategy. Drill Bits. This one's interesting considering this is a Rakdos card. It doesn't feel very aggressive. But the spectacle cost here is pretty decent, I think, in limited games generally. Here's the deal. A Thought C style effect at 3 can be just fine in limited, but I usually would tend to put those more into a control build. So maybe an Esper build would be a little more interesting for this, perhaps. But I would not rule this out of even an aggressive deck, which feels a little counterintuitive because you're taking pressure off to use this. But I don't want to discount that spectacle cost of just one black. Look at it this way. Turn one, I play something. Maybe I can attack with that something on turn two and get by. If that's the case, then on turn two, I'm able to already play this. That could be pretty strong in Drafter Sealed, even if I'm on an aggressive build. Or even if that doesn't work out, let's say later in the game I get this card. I can do damage in some way, shape, or form. One black isn't a huge commitment. And then I may be able to play this and still make an aggressive play on the same turn. I wouldn't hate this card. I don't know if it always makes my build. It just depends on how aggressive and how all in on the aggressive mechanics I'm going to be for Rakdos especially. But I think many times I do end up playing this mostly because the spectacle cost is too tempting. This is another card that could be good in Orzov as well. Maybe even better in Orzov because you're not as dependent on early plays there. Rakdos Trumpeteer, a 1-3 for 2, okay, with Menace, so that's pretty good, because early in the game I might be able to get this across even for 1 damage, which Rakdos will be interested in, but more importantly, maybe it could turn on Spectacle. Now, later in the game, it pumps its power with red and 3, so plus 2 plus 0 for 4 mana could be relevant from time to time, though it would make it a 3-3 Menace if you just did it once, and it is a Mana Sink, so you could do it multiple times. Worst case scenario, maybe later in the game, it can take out two creatures when it gets blocked. At least you got some economy out of this two mana creature, even if you did use the mana sink. So yeah, I think it's actually pretty decent. It's good early, it's good late. It's a common I would definitely play in Rakdos. Are you ready for crazy mythics that you'll never open, but it feels like everybody else opened at the pre-release? Spawn of Mayhem. Two black and two, four, four, flying trample. Stop me there. I'm going to play this thing. It's awesome. Two black and one spectacle cost even better. Beginning of your upkeep, it deals one damage to each player, so that does include yourself too, keep that in mind. But it's going to keep damaging, even in a board stall, your opponent on the other side of the table. If you're in Rakdos colors, that could be important. And what else does it do, everybody? It turns on Spectacle, of course. Later in the game, when your life total gets lower, which this actually does help you get there, then it also grows with plus one, plus one counters. Yeah, if you can play this, play it. Again, if I'm looking for a problem with it, it might be hard to splash in some decks being double black, but play this if you can. It's amazing. Bedevil. Okay. Two black and one. Instant destroy target artifact creature or planeswalker. It's a rare. You won't see it a lot, but sign me up if I do see it. It's awesome. Lots of versatility. The only drawback is it's a little strict on color with two black and red, but if you can swing the color requirement, put it in your deck. It's awesome. Captive Audience. Okay, another mythic. Now, this is good. It's not the magic bullet, though, so don't get it in your head that if I get this magical Christmas land, I always win. It does cost seven. That's a little expensive, but when you do it, it's going to feel really good. Like, this is going to be awesome. Now, if you're already losing the game and they're about to finish you off, that seven mana probably didn't do a whole lot for you. 
They might be able to discard their hand, which could be empty anyway, who knows. They might even be able to go down to four life and not have a problem. They might even be able to give you two two black zombie tokens, five of them, and that might still be okay if they have flyers or something, right? So it doesn't mean you win the game. But it does paint your opponent into a corner pretty quickly, right? And if you have a board stall or you're going to slam the door on a game anyway, this will do it for you, I have no doubt, most of the time, right? So I like my seven mana spells to help catch me up if I'm really behind, and I don't know if this is always going to do that. But it's still really, really solid and definitely playable in Sealed or Draft. Called Guild Mage. This is a good Guild Mage in these colors. Uh, first off, the art is incredible. Got to point that out. Now, the first ability, it's good. Like, it doesn't tie into the aggressive aspect of Rakdos as much as I would like, maybe. But making my opponent discard cards, especially in the middle portion of the game, is decent. Later in the game, this isn't always as good because, obviously, sitting on the battlefield, your opponent knows that this is there, and they're just going to play their stuff as it comes out. It does disrupt their gameplay if they want to hold instants and things like that, but still, it might not necessarily be backbreaking later on. And in the middle of the game, it is a mana commitment, which might lead to slowing yourself down as well. The second ability, though, is fantastic. We've been talking about this all day. Dealing one damage to target opponent or planeswalker for just one red and tapping. Turns on, spectacle, and yep, there it is again. And also, like I said, Rakdos, sometimes they just need to get those last points of damage across and they can't do it anymore through combat, this is another way to do it. Fireblade Artist, real solid aggressive 2-drop here. 2-2 two, two with haste for 2, even though it is two different colors, so maybe it's not always a turn 2 play, maybe a turn 3 play sometimes, but still, it can attack in early, I love that. At the beginning of your upkeep, you may sack a creature. If you do, it deals 2 damage to target opponent or planeswalker. So here we are again, a way to do direct damage and turn on spectacle and push across extra damage when you can't get across anymore. And it ties into the whole sacrifice mechanic as well, which we saw a little heavier when we were looking at the cards in black yesterday. Get the point. Get this card is what I'm going to say. Yeah, this is going to be awesome for you. Splashable if you're in one or the other color to instant speed, destroy target creature, and scry one. It's a common. You might be able to find these a little easier than many of the good removal spells that are out there. But this is solid removal. Maybe more expensive than some, but it's going to deal with most of your creature problems. It's an instant, and the scry one is especially relevant for Rakdos, although that's good any time. This is awesome. Hacrobats. All right, this is a solid aggressive creature, too. A 2-3 for 3 are really nice stats. A little more stable than some of the aggressive creatures you typically see. Spectacle cost of just a red and black. That's pretty good. And then these abilities are awesome. Black is at least going to foreshadow some death touch. Even if you don't pay the black... You attack with it, your opponent knows you can pay the black. They have a decision to make. Do they take it? Do they block with a creature that they might not want to lose, which they will probably lose? If they decide they don't want to lose board state, if they take it, now you just pay the red. It's a 4-1. That's quite a bit of damage, actually. This card is really sweet. And also, of course, if you have a creature that's going to maybe force damage more frequently than another creature, that is another way to turn on Spectacle, too. So keep that in mind. Ultimately, this is a great uncommon for Rakdos. Judith the Scourge Diva. This one's a rare. You're not going to see a ton of it, but other creatures you control get plus one, plus oh. All right. That's a good start right there. Again, aggressive decks will really appreciate that. Anyway, they can push more damage across. They will be on board. That power boost is also good in Mardu builds for the spirit tokens. And also, whenever a non-token creature you control dies, this will deal one damage to any target. So it plays into the sacrifice or benefit ability. Now when your stuff dies, and it could just die naturally, too. This will start to add up over time. Doing damage to any target, but that could include an opponent, is going to be a way to keep the pressure on, even through a board stall. And beyond that, it turns on, say it with me now, Spectacle. 2-2 two, two for 3, maybe not the most impressive stats, and yes, it is a little fragile, but if it can stay alive, it can do a lot. It's another threaten effect, Macabre Mockery. This one's a little different, though, because it actually takes the creature out of opponent's graveyard as opposed to the battlefield. So it doesn't put their defenses down when you play this necessarily, but it does boost the creature, plus two, plus so. This does get better later in the game when there's going to be more targets for it. It's not always going to be a turn four play. Much like other threaten effects, though, you do have to sack it at the beginning of the next end step. But you get to attack in with it. It has haste, of course. And it is an instant, which is a big difference compared to the others we looked at today. So you could use this as a combat trick defensively. That's actually pretty cool, too. Or you could just simply take a creature with a good tap effect out of your opponent's graveyard. Use that tap effect. That could be good enough as well. So this is pretty decent for four mana instant speed. I like it a lot. 
And remember, you have the sacrifice effects. So even though, yes, you would sacrifice it anyway, at the end of the turn, it would just go to your opponent's graveyard. You might be able to sacrifice it for an ability even better. Not as backbreaking as when you do that to a creature you took off the battlefield, but still good. And yet another card that would fit into that Mardu strategy too. Rafter Demon. This one's okay. Spectacle cost of five, which is one more than the four, because you do get an extra ability. That ability is, if it enters the battlefield with Spectacle, each opponent discards a card. Problem is, it's super fragile a 4-2. I don't like paying five for a 4-2. I don't like paying four for a 4-2. It's bad economy. I don't mind the discard effect, but I'm not all in necessarily on that plan if I'm in Rakdos Colors. I might care more about just keeping the pressure on. And this does put a little pressure on being high power, but like I said, it's going to trade down. So if I can avoid this one, a lot of the time I think I do. I don't think it's unplayable, though, but many times you will have better things. Rakdos Firewheeler, here's the uncommon that's on double color for this color combination. And much like the others, they're solid cards, but the only drawback is they are mana intensive when it comes to color. So you have to be pretty confident that your deck can cast it. Not very splashable, but in a Rakdos deck, this will be great. 4-3 for 4, maybe a tad bit fragile on that toughness, but still not bad. When it enters the battlefield, it deals 2 damage to target opponent and 2 damage to up to 1 target creature or planeswalker. So that's really nice because you get versatility here. Of course, you know what I'm going to say. It pushes damage across for Rakdos when sometimes they can't get the damage across. It just adds into the equation of getting them down to 0. And it's going to turn on Spectacle. That's fantastic. Now. You are paying four for this, so do you have mana left over for a spectacle spell? Sometimes you will, sometimes you won't, but it's an option. Then on top of that, it's a nice board presence swing, giving you this 4-3 and hopefully taking out a small creature. Or it can also interact with a planeswalker, which occasionally could be relevant. Yeah, if you can swing the casting cost, go for it. It's great. Also, this might not be easy to cast in a Mardu deck, but if you have a light white splash, this is another card that could be flickered. Rakdos roused about. Now, yesterday's video, we were talking about some cards that can turn on Spectacle, but wow, if you were wondering where they all are, here they are. This is a 3-2 three, for 3. Normally, I would say don't touch it, especially on two different colors, because it will trade down, yada, yada, yada. But this time, I'm on board, because this is a way to force one more point of damage, even if it's blocked, which, again, could be relevant sometimes. Every point will count with Rakdos. And, I can't believe I'm saying it again, but... It will turn on Spectacle, and it's a free way to turn on Spectacle. I like that better than a spell that will do damage because that eats into your mana on that turn. This time, you could play the creature and next turn attack in. Even if it gets blocked, it deals the one damage to the player, and then I have all my mana free for a Spectacle spell. That's pretty awesome. Another card that could interact with the Planeswalker, too. Rakdos the Showstopper. Now, I didn't mention this specifically through the video series since this is a mythic, but this card does make any Demon, Devil, or Imp that much better. Especially in a draft. Maybe you'll have more opportunity to pick up those type of cards. Now, let's talk about this thing on its own. 6-6. Six, six, flying Trample for 6. That's pretty impressive. What could go wrong? Well, it has an element of variance. When this enters the battlefield, flip a coin for each creature that isn't a Demon, Devil, or Imp. Destroy each creature whose coin comes up tails. Okay. So, randomly, it's going to start blowing stuff up. It could wipe out all of your opponent's stuff and none of your stuff, right? If everything goes your way. Or it could, vice versa, wipe out all your stuff and none of your opponent's stuff. Maybe your opponent has some demons in play. Who knows? Is that the worst thing in the world, though? If that were to happen, yeah, sometimes it could lose you the game, maybe. But a lot of the time, it might still be okay because you still got a 6-6 six, six flying trample creature for 6. Especially if you are playing this on, like, turn 6 or 7. There might not be enough for your opponent to have on the battlefield that's that devastating at this point in the game, right? This is very solid, and it's definitely worth the risk. Now, most of the time, I think your opponent will lose some things, you might lose some things, and you still end up ahead with this 6-6 Flying Trample creature. That's what should happen a majority of the time, I think. Once in a while, something could go wrong with this card, sure, but it's definitely worth the risk. The upside is just too great. It's too good of a creature to not play. It is mythic, you won't see it a lot, but it is splashable, so if you're playing black or red, you could sneak it in there. And I think it is definitely worth it. I'll play it if I get a chance. If your opponent plays this, check your sideboard for demons, devils, and imps. Theater of Horrors. Okay, this card is awesome. 
Three casting cost enchantment, so a little startup cost there, but it's a great mana sink. With a red and three, it will deal one damage to target opponent or planeswalker. Another way to interact with planeswalkers, but more importantly, it's a mana sink that pushes damage across to your opponent, and that could really help Rakdos in the long game. And, yep, I'm going to do it one more time at least. It turns on Spectacle. So, that's pretty awesome, but it does more than that. At the beginning of your upkeep, exile the top card of your library. During your turn, so yes, it's only during your turn, if an opponent lost life this turn, so kind of like Spectacle, you may play cards exiled with this. Now, notice when you exile a card with this, it's not like you can only play it until end of turn. It stays attached to this card, so whenever you activate the ability, you can play any of the cards that have been exiled. Notice it also says play and not cast, so that means you could play a land from there, so that's kind of cool, nice economy. And to damage your opponent, this actually has a way to do that for 4 mana. Now granted, it is a little costly at 4 mana, but still, later in the game, you won't care. It gives you access to more cards, which Rakdos really, really needs. It can do direct damage, which Rakdos really, really needs. This is awesome. It's a rare. It's not going to show up all the time, but this is the type of card that if I see this in pack 1, I'd be real tempted to take this and just try to force Rakdos. It's that strong. Hybrid card here with Footlight Fiend. Yeah, it's a solid, like, one drop for Rakdos. It's nothing crazy. I like the fact that it's hybrid, so that gives you some flexibility. And when it dies, it deals one damage to any target. So, potentially, it could die in your turn, and it's another way to turn out Spectacle for free. Yup, okay, it wasn't the last time, and it won't be the last time. Who am I kidding? It is just a cheap little creature. It might not always make your cut, but for an aggressive build, I don't think it's bad, especially with that ability. Bedeck and Bedazzle. This is actually pretty awesome. Okay, now the first side of the card really caught my attention because it is hybrid mana. It's very flexible. I could put it really into any deck where I can swing the double black, double red, or the combination of the two. That's nice flexibility. Target creature gets plus three, minus three until end of turn. So if I'm attacking in, I could surprise my opponent at instant speed, do some more damage. Rakdos would be interested in that. Or defensively, if I have a high enough toughness creature, I could use this as a defensive combat trick, or I could just use this as a removal spell for a three or less toughness power creature. That's awesome, awesome flexibility for what you're paying here. Amazing card. If I feel comfortable with the casting cost in any deck, I'm going to try to work this in. Okay, let's look at Bedazzle. Destroy target non-basic land. It will deal two damage to target opponent or planeswalker. I think you'll come across enough non-basic lands to find a target for this with guild gates and such. But I don't know how relevant that will be. Like I said earlier, typically this type of card would be a sideboard card for me if my opponent's getting greedy on color. Now, aside from that, it also could turn on Spectacle and keep the damage going for Rakdos, which is very good. Also interacts with the Planeswalker again. So it does a lot of the things that have been good for that deck. But I don't care necessarily about that side as much as I care about the left side. So I'm playing this card, and every once in a while, the Bedazzle will come in handy when it does wonderful, but most of the time I'm playing this just for the Bedeck. And even if I'm in a deck that can't play Bedazzle, like I'm in a deck that's not running red or black, but I'm running the other color, then, you know what, I don't care, because the Bedeck is so good. Alright, one last time, Carnival and Carnage. What's it going to do, everybody? Carnival is going to deal one damage to target creature or planeswalker and one damage to that permanent's controller. So yes, it is a way to maybe take out a low toughness creature, but more importantly, either interact with a planeswalker or turn on spectacle. Yep. It's another way to push damage across, turn on spectacle. It only costs one, so that's kind of nice. Leaves a lot of mana open for your spectacle spell. Carnage, if I have more mana available, now it can do three damage to target opponent. That player discards two cards. That's good in Rakdos. It might not be that great in other builds, but in Rakdos, I would definitely be happy with that. It's going to turn on Spectacle. It's going to make the opponent discard, and it goes to the face when I need to push across damage any way possible. For four mana, that's not bad. Very, very playable in Rakdos. This one, though, not as flexible as the card we saw previously. Okay, the one artifact, Rakdos Locket. Now, I talked about lockets in detail in part one, so I won't rehash all of that, but I will say this. The Rakdos Locket, within Rakdos Colors anyway, maybe isn't as impressive because I don't think you care about ramping as much in this color combination, as much as you're just simply going to want to keep the pressure on on turn 3 or turn 4, as opposed to taking time off to play this. It does maybe let you see more cards later that's kind of interesting, 
but I don't think this is going to be necessarily great within Rakdos colors. Better for splashing one of the two colors. Okay, the last two cards are lands, and they're reprints. You know what they are. Blood Crypt, of course, is the shock land that is within the Rakdos colors. Great for color fixing. And the two pieces of art for Rakdos Guild Gate. Now, I talked about the shock lands and the Guild Gates again in the previous video, so I don't want to go into a lot of detail, but I'm going to say this about the Rakdos Guild Gate. Maybe not as good as some of the other Guild Gates if you're in these colors, because Rakdos does not want to be slowed down, especially early on in the game. So this could be a little awkward, but if you need to fix mana, you need to fix mana. Again, much like the Locket, this might be better to splash one of the two colors more so than just putting it into a Rakdos deck a lot of the time. All right, with that being said, guess what? That is the end of part four. We got one more part to go. Tomorrow, we're going to come back and we're going to talk all about Gruul. We're going to finish up this set. But until next time, hey, thanks for watching. Please remember to like and subscribe and have a great day. Hey, thanks for watching. This video is made possible through the generous support of viewers like you on Patreon. Check out the description below for links to our Patreon page as well as our Amazon affiliate store where a small percentage of all sales will also help support the channel. Finally, if you haven't had a chance yet to subscribe, hit that subscribe button so you don't miss any of the new videos on Heroes and Legends. Talk to you again soon and have a great day.